here now. And you can imagine uh, canoeing along in the, in the Arctic twilight of those days with perhaps dinosaurs by the bayou, just paddling along when the uh, sun began to go down again with the beginning of the Arctic winter and the bald cypress trees dropping their needles and turning rusty colored in the uh, in this sort of slowly sinking sun. And you know how we enjoy so much a crepuscular twilight uh, environment. And thinking of the... Um, of the forces of, of a Mesozoic nature, of a dinosaurian nature, preparing themselves for a, a warm, long winter night, uh, slowly shutting down. Uh, the dinosaurs, perhaps with the uh, adolescent, uh, fleshed out young, uh, beginning to form up and, and going to the south again. But the, and the plants, it would have been an absolutely glorious autumn, slowly fading into a polar night uh, where there was no frost and it was warm. In the Arctic, we really don't know what we're going to be finding. So in this sense, this aspect of our work together is, is truly explorational. We're not following a thesis. So there's something, you know, there's a little bit more excitement and there's a lot more risk in working in the North. The Arctic and the rest of the world were separated from Central Asia during the middle of the dinosaur age. But as the reign of the dragon was nearing its end, Asia and North America were linked by a land bridge across the Bering Strait or the Eastern Arctic. Fossils found in the Arctic confirm that dinosaurs once lived here, suggesting that dinosaurs used this bridge to cross between continents. So while Tyrannosaurus rex was terrorizing North America, his cousin, Tarbosaurus batar, was having the same kind of fun in Central Asia. For Dong Zheming, this is a strange and wondrous experience, for he knows that 40,000 years ago, that same land bridge enabled people from Asia to cross over to North America. I'm from China. Yeah? Yeah. Don't like I have my face. Yeah. You people are the same? Well, you look That's like each other. You look so. like each other. Yeah? My face. Yeah? Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Anything we find here is direct proof of animal life that was living in the polar regions at that time. We know indirectly because of distributions of dinosaurs around the Pacific Rim that many different kinds of dinosaurs must have inhabited the Arctic, but we don't have direct evidence of them yet. This is the most recent piece in the jigsaw puzzle of clues to the life of the dinosaur. In 1986, a local boy found a strange blue bone on Violet Island, 20 miles across the ice from Pond Inlet. Among the Inuit, this place is now known as Dinosaur Valley, and it is here, under the leadership of the Canadian Museum of Nature, that they will set up camp for the third step in the Canada-China hunt for the dragon.
site's over the hill over there. We're about 10 minutes away from it. You didn't tell me about the hotel. Oh, well, it's not pitched yet. We're laying the foundation. The foundation is a good cup of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> They came in summer to avoid the bad weather. One of the things people always seem to forget in paleontology, you mean, is that you know it's not all that easy. We go all the way from 40 degrees above zero in the Gobi Desert, and then we end up in situations like this where it's really cold outside. People just tend to think that we're outside in the sun and it's quite enjoyable all the time, and it's almost never that way. You got there it? There we go. But if they this have another snow, maybe tomorrow cannot work. Uh, Freezing? 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 Even if the snow or rain goes off, as long as it's clear, we can still get out and work. So. Yeah. It is in the Arctic that Dong Jiming is introduced to that renowned Canadian delicacy, the fried Spam and ketchup sandwich. Geez, that's delectable. <laughs> This is the riskiest expedition of them all, the most difficult and the least likely to provide museum quality specimens. There isn't much to go on except the isolated find of an old blue bone. to get your search image going here because color is no clue. The bone is either nice and white or sort of a bluish black or black. And depending on how fresh the surface is, and of course the rocks are exactly the same colors. <laughs> Basically, you've got to pick up each one and take a look at it if you want to find bone. It is Dong Jiming, yeah. half a world away from his beloved Gobi, who makes the first find in yeah. this new dinosaur valley. Hmm. Identify the bone and not the bone. That's bone. This bone, yeah. yeah. This bone might be silker, yeah. So it's right, I think so. It's hard to say what this bone is, but uh, it almost has a turtley appearance to it, eh? A few more like that, and we'll be able to identify them, maybe. Oh, I like. <laughs> enjoy it, enjoy it, yeah, you enjoy it. I hope we can find the tooth. The dental tooth is identified, it's very important. There? Come on. This bug. Right. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Well, it's a terrestrial vertebrate. Technician Clayton Kennedy finds a bone containing this tooth sockets, a, but still no teeth. Just sort of draw the tooth sockets along the inside. There's an articulation here. So it's a very small hadrosaur. If we look for the small pieces, we'll find the big pieces. The Arctic discoveries will come nowhere close to the success of the Gobi or Alberta. And even when they move further north, the pickings will remain slim. By the time the Arctic hunt comes to an end, the steps forward will have been small, but they will have been steps and they will have established beyond doubt that dinosaurs once walked on this most desolate of lands. Or neural spine. Okay, great. You know, my, my real problem is, is I got a little wee tiny small brain in which I'm trying to reconstruct the world. <laughs> and I, 